um, if we have time. So Sam, our first question is from Tatiana. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. She's an amazing artist. She does um, beautiful 3D images. Um, and she wanted to ask you, how long would it take to lower a lifeboat from the Californian? She's still thinking along alternate history lines. <laughs> I would only guess. I, <clears throat> I, I would just have to guess. Uh, usually, you would take somebody to pay out the falls of about six minutes to actually lower about 50 feet. If you, okay. if you do it any quicker, you may wind up with a bunch of people in the water, which I don't think is a good idea. Okay. All right. But about, I would say <clears throat> the actual lowering itself would be probably about five, six minutes to actually drop it safely into the uh, water. So okay. Yeah, I know. Um, I know she's really interested in, in gathering information about um, details like that. Um, I noticed that Carolyn is here. She's from Belfast and she would like to know with all the experience and knowledge you know now, could you speak if you could speak to the Titanic inquiry, would you advise or tell them anything in re relation to the Californian? Well, the first thing I would do is tell them they were wrong about where the Titanic sank. <laughs> we now know exactly where Titanic sank, it was 13 miles to the east of what they thought it was. So they got the position That's wrong and as far as California, from what I could tell um, right now, they somehow got it right, but for some of the wrong reasons, um, because they didn't really know where Titanic was, and they didn't follow through in all the evidence that we have available to us today, partly because not only the, the wreck site was unknown, but it just wasn't enough time to study all the evidence in the detail necessary to sort out some of the clues that gave away where the uh, Californian had to be. Um, but it looks like, at least from what we could tell today, that the only real mystery ship around was Californian. And unfortunately, um, they were not sure what they were looking at from Titanic. They weren't sure what they were looking at. And because of the clarity of the night, the ships that were much further away than they really were were thought to be a lot closer. <clears throat> so when you hear people like Second Officer Stone or the Apprentice Gibson or Groves, any of the Californian officers saying that they saw a ship about five miles away. They were they're not lying. That's what they're that's where they estimated it to be. But the problem was that the night was so clear that lights were very bright, much brighter than they would normally be, because there was very little what we call in engineering attenuation of the, the light sources. So they appeared closer than what they actually were. And so a ship that was twice as far away would have seemed to be half as close. But the indisputable fact is that California, the officers on California, well, actually two of them, Stone and the apprentice Gibson, saw rockets in the night. They saw eight, they counted eight white rockets sent up at intervals, which they, which they would have known, certainly Stone would have known, represents distress. And no matter what they tried to come up with later excuses for failing to act, the indisputable fact today, and I don't think people who are supporters of uh, Stanley Lord included, they cannot deny the fact they, they saw the distress signals from Titanic. It was during the same time interval that Titanic was sending these signals up. And 
they just did not really act. I mean, the biggest, I mean, the major flaw was when Captain Lord was informed about the sighting of the rockets, he remained below. He decided to leave it to his second officer, Stone, to tell him if, if what he's looking at was some problem like distress signals. At least that's what he said in the court. Um, and Stone went down to him for him to decide something which he never saw. And so there was a major communications problem between Stone and Lord, which I believe has led to the whole affair. And if it wasn't for that, what, what Stone should have done is insisted, look, I see these signals that look like rockets. They're coming about every five minutes. Please come up and have a look yourself. I insist you come up on deck. Stone did not do that. The other thing he could have done on his own mm -hmm. is wake up the wireless operator, Evans, and say, we, we're seeing a ship out there throwing up rockets. Could you see if there's anything you could find out on the wireless? In which case, he, they would have found out immediately what was going on. He did none of that. I mean, the only thing, if I recall correctly, Captain Lord told Stone to do was go back and try to contact this steamer by Morse lamp. The Morse lamp is not a signaling lamp like you have, like you, you've seen in World War II ships where they have this very bright spotlight type device that they are able to send more signals. So it wasn't, it was a very, in fact, if you look at close-ups of Titanic and you look at the bridge wing, it's that little device, the black, the, the little top of the bridge wing, which, is, which are the Morse lamps. And they were only good for about, typically about five miles. Uh, and if you're lucky, they, they, you, you would be able to see, see them around even 10 miles away. But they were not designed like they, used, they did for the signaling lamps of World War II, the, the, the Aegis lamps. So when they first saw the ship stop about 1130 um, Californian time, the first thing they tried to do is contact the ship by Morse lamp, and they didn't see any reply. It's funny on, on Titanic when they first noticed this other their mystery vessel show up in the morning while they were uh, actually swinging out the lifeboats or actually uncovering the boats. They also tried to call them up by a Morse lamp, and they never saw a reply either. Although it's been reported that some stewards on the bridge did see something that looked like a reply. But the fourth officer, Boxel, uh, he, he himself said he did not see any reply. In any event, the more signaling, because of the distances involved, just wouldn't work. It was, it was very, very difficult to, to, um, to actually pick up. But the strange thing to me is when Lord was informed about rockets, it was about an hour after the steamer had already stopped. And for an hour, they never got a reply. So why would he tell Stone to go back and continue something that didn't work to begin with? I mean, in my own mind, and I think a lot of other people have always asked the same question, and I don't have an answer for it. He should have gone in and asked and woke up the wireless operator and say, see if you could find out something. He didn't do that until something like 5.15 in the morning after it became big, you know, light enough to see around that he, when he was told by Chief Officer Stewart, what the second officer told him uh, when he got relieved at four o'clock about a ship out that was out there throwing rockets up during the night. Lord said, yeah, I know, I was in, I, I've been told about it. But then Stewart said, well, maybe I think he may have lost his rudder because I think we see him now. Turns out that was not the same vessel, obviously. But Lord says, okay, in that case, you better, why don't you go wake up the wireless operator? And this, this was a conversation they had around 5 a.m. in the morning when Lord was trying to figure out the best way to resume their voyage you know, to Boston because it got stopped during the night by an ice field that they couldn't proceed further. And rightly so, 
pretty dangerous crossing ice in the middle of the night, especially if you can't see too far uh, in front of you uh, in terms of the water or anything like that. It was just pure ice, it was just a, a sheet of ice that they were up against and they had to stop for the night. But it wasn't until 5.15 in the morning that he told his chief officer to go and wake up the wireless operator way too late. As I said, I, can, I have no, no idea why, what was going through Lord's head in the middle of the night when they actually informed him about seeing rockets during the night, why he didn't just get up and come up and go up on deck. I just don't know. And that's one area I usually don't get into. I don't like to speculate. That's not what I do. <laughs> I try to just base my research on what was said and what we could analyze as fact. But um, so hopefully I answered the question, although it took a long time to say. <laughs> oh, it was really informative. Thank you. I'm sure everyone was hanging on your every word like I was. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And my last question um, before I move on to the other admins is from Jordan Tancheski. Chan He's from Australia. And he just wanted to say, it's not a question, he wanted to say, Hi, and thank you for um, your research because it's really helping him a lot with his 3D project that he's working on and uh, especially the, the final plunge. And he hopes he'll be able to connect with you soon. So that's be interesting more to see it. Okay. And he's going to, he's starting a website. I'll, I can send that to you later. I'll connect you guys. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going to move it on to Terry, who has a couple of questions, and then after that, Alicia. Go ahead, Terry. Hi, hey, Terry. Stefan. See if I can do this without. All right, here we. What is my computer doing? Okay. Okay. I think Hello. I'm having problems with the audio here, so. Okay, my, my internet's unstable. Oh, uh, so it might be her computer. Can you hear me now? Right yes. now, yes. For Jamie Borsato from the Netherlands, do you have any new books in the works? Jamie said that in his eyes, you write the best books. Well, thank you, Jamie. Uh, the answer to that question is very simple, no. I don't have any books in the works. The um, latest project I did just completed uh, was with several other people. You may have recently seen it online. It was called Abandoning Titanic, Abandoning Reality. It's a 36 page article, which is available to anyone online. You can download it, um, which deals with the, a recent documentary that, will, that has aired, which tried to lay blame on the steamship Mount Temple for being the mystery vessel seen from Titanic. And we were able to actually prove, prove without a doubt that Mount Temple could not have been anywhere close to where Titanic was while Titanic was sinking and firing off rockets. So. It, and also, um, it was produced by Sina Maloney, who has long uh, been under the uh, Im impression that uh, Mount Temple was the mystery vessel. He even wrote a book about it called Titanic Scandal, which was a sort of fictionalized trial of the Mount, of Mount Temple's captain, E.J. Moore. Um, to which he tried to play both uh, prosecutor and defense attorneys. <laughs> and the problem that I had with that, is to, to present the evidence that he was collecting over the years, the problem I have with that is if you are trying to play both prosecutor and defense attorney and you already made up your mind what the outcome is, you cannot be objective. Right. And sure enough, I, I actually have a copy of Seaman's book he tried to sell me a copy, by the way, when he was up in Boston. 
for a TIS uh, conference. But I bought it afterwards, and um, it, it's a lot of a lot of areas that, um, if you had asked me, why don't you take the uh, job of defense attorney, and I'll take the job of prosecuting attorney, I think the book could have been, could have come out a lot better, <laughs> uh, and and the conclusions would be, would be a lot different. But in any event, Seaman decided um, to come up with this documentary because he must he stumbled on apparently he stumbled on some additional evidence based from a world war one german raider the raider that actually sank mount temple during world war one where the captain of the raider of the raider noted that mount temple's masts were relatively closely spaced okay well what does that mean i know and Seenan remembered that fourth author Boxall of Titanic mentioned that the mast lights of the vessel that he was looking at, this mystery vessel, were seemed to be closely spaced. He used the same words, closely spaced. And Seenan put two and two together and had a eureka moment. It has to be Mount oh. Temple. The problem was, as we showed in the in our article that we put in an article, we have to put two photographs, one of Mount Temple and another of Californian profile, one of, by the other. And we, sh and we adjusted the scale so that the, the relative lengths of the two vessels were identical. The masts yeah. on the Californian are actually more closely spaced closely than those together, exactly. on Mount Temple. Exactly. Um, and it was just comical that he would use that as, an, as additional evidence. In fact, what Boxall actually meant, if you actually read the context, and you have to read, you just can't pick up something in, uh, let's say, the testimony, the testimony documents and just pick out a line or two or cherry pick it. Right. You need to understand the context behind what they're saying. And what Boxall was saying it was that the mast lights of the of this mystery vessel were coming close together. They appeared close together. What it means is that a ship that carried two mast lights, one is higher than the other. The, the one behind the foremast is actually has to be carried higher than the other. When a ship is facing towards you, those lights are going to come together. They're going to sort of line up one over the other when they're exactly head on, it would be one over the other. What Boxall was simply saying was that the other ship was, point, was coming around and pointing toward them. It was swinging around, pointing towards Titanic. That's what he meant by the lights were closely spaced, not that the masts upon which the lights are mounted were closely spaced. You can't, you can't, he could not see the masts, he couldn't see the funnels, he can't see the hull. The only thing you could see from Titanic was the lights of another ship. Lights, nothing else. And the same thing's true of California. They could see nothing of Titanic's hull uh, or superstructure or, or funnels or mass. They could only see the lights of Titanic. And Titanic at the time was pointing towards, pretty much towards California, uh, showing the her red side light, the port light. Uh, had, they have what a submariner would call a narrow angle on the bow. Um, so you had not a broadside view of Titanic. It was actually almost close to being um, sort of head on, which also made the, the width of the, of the lights of the vessel seem more closely spaced. Again, giving the impression that the vessel could have been a lot closer than it actually appeared to be because of the angle at which it was pointing. But the, you couldn't see any part of the vessel itself, itself, only her lights. And that's what people were basing their conclusions on and their judgment of distances. And in fact, Boxwell even said, the way he, he arrived at the five mile distance was the brightness of the lights that he saw of this mystery vessel, which I believe was California. Okay. And okay, this is my own question. I think you might have partially answered it, 
Oh, and I read the article. It was it was a great article, by the way. And I watched the thing uh, just for the kicks of just for the heck of it. And I just I I, I rolled the whole thing. Just watched it. Um, and this is my own question. And I think you partially answered it. Can you please explain please explain the importance of the SS Californians? I guess you could say rotation. Up, quote unquote, stopped in the water. That part I didn't get. You talked about how she. Uh, Okay, there you go. Kind of like rotated, like she was stopped, and she kind of. I think I think that's what you were talking about, the rotation. Right. Yes. Can you explain that again? Sure. The, the technical term, or the 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 technical term for that was swinging around. The, the ship was swinging around in the uh, local current that she was in. That was about. She was only located about a, a, a quarter mile. From the edge of the ice field, and the, what you will have in, 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 under those situations, you, you have differences in water temperature close, because of the ice melting close by, and, and so you have some local, very small local currents that will cause a ship that's not under power to swing around. Plus, as Stone wrote in his letter that, or his report, he made to. Uh, Captain Lord on the uh, 18th of April, which by the way, was withheld from the inquiries in 1912. He mentioned that the night was very calm with, 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 with uh, it was very clear and calm with small winds, or he called it small airs, meaning there, the, uh, once in a while, there would be a wind that picked up briefly, sort of, uh, randomly, you know, from different directions. And though combined with the local, you know, being in, you know, local currents close to a nice field uh, had a tendency to swing the vessel around. So the vessel is not just point, it's already stopped, <coughs> obviously not anchored to anything. So it was very free to swing around with just any little disturbance of either the sea or the wind that's acting on the actual superstructure. And Californian was actually, on the average, swinging around in a clockwise rotation. It started off when it originally stopped, it was facing sort of northeastward. And at the time that Titanic um, actually sank, it was already pointing towards, sort of towards, down towards the southwest. And later on, around almost 3.30, when the rockets of Carpathia was actually sighted in California, not only Titanic's rockets, they also saw three rockets fired from Carpathia uh, around 3.30. Um, California was sort of pointing westward. And um, the problem is, is that if you just watch a vessel or the lights of a vessel to be more exact from far away and the only thing, and you watch it long enough you notice the lights are changing a bit one way or another they're swinging around it's rotating uh, you sometimes could have the impression that this vessel is not stopped it's moving it's swinging plus the fact there's evidence that came from quartermaster George Rowe, that Titanic herself actually originally pointed directly northwest when she sort of stopped or soon after, and then swung a little bit round, a little bit more northerly for about 22 degrees, two points to north northwest before he actually left to get into lifeboat number C or boat C. And so the combined effect, slight, slight rotational movement of Titanic, plus the much more movement of Californian swinging around, easily could give the impression that this mystery vessel is not perfectly stationary, but is slowly moving around or moving. And it may be moving towards you, particularly if the mast lights started lining up for at one point, which they did, and California was pointing directly at Titanic. Oh, sure. 
Thank you very much, Sam. Appreciate it. Sure. I'm going to go ahead and the next person. Oh, my friend Bill. If you're done, Terry, it's um, Alicia's turn. Uh, okay, is it okay for it's okay for me to go? Yeah. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Alicia. I'm from Michigan. I actually have two questions. Uh, the first one, let me just say first off that I don't know if my sources are trustworthy, hence the question. Uh, I was under the impression that Cal logbooks were actually missing or had disappeared. Uh, but according, it looks like in the inquiry that they were actually used in the inquiry itself. Uh, does this mean the books themselves were actually available or testimony was given that this is what we put in the book versus the book itself actually being present? I believe the, when Captain Lord came to the, at the British inquiry for sure. No, no, but I think both, if I'm not mistaken. He brought with him the logbooks from California. Um, whether they, the logbooks were submitted or not, I do not recall. Um, I do remember that there was a um, map, a hand-drawn map or chart that Captain Lord put together that was submitted to the British inquiry, um, where he tried to show his ship's position relative to what he thought was the general um, shape of the ice field and the position of the uh, mystery ship. But of course, um, it, it, that, that, would, that chart was submitted as evidence from, uh, the, that he developed, uh, he said, while he was on his way down from Boston to, the, uh, uh, to testify at the American inquiry. And, and, was presented as evidence at the British inquiry um, later on, which came a couple of few weeks afterwards. But uh, my understanding was that uh, when Captain Lord and Chief Officer Stewart testified, certainly at the British inquiry, they were reading directly out of the Californian logbook. Now, remember the logbook was the official logbook, which is written up not at the time that the events took place, uh, the, uh, when things, when a officer on the watch, when the watch period ends, they're supposed to enter um, the relevant data um, into what they call a scrap log, which is, a, which is either a book you uh, just write things down in and throw away the pages, or what used to be in, uh, in some ships, just a um, blackboard slate. It was then later copied by the chief officer whose duty it was to actually maintain the log books. It was the, whatever was in the scrap log would be copied into the official log book um, later on. And then the, log, the, 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 the scrap log would be um, discarded. I, th I believe today, if I'm not mistaken, that the uh, laws require scrap logs to be saved as well in case something happens you know, uh, during a particular voyage. Uh, but in those days, the, the, it was, it, they didn't have that kind of a requirement. But as far as what was put in the logbook, the actual data, that has been interesting. That's come under it, it's some interesting questions that people have raised over the years. Uh, what was in the scrap log may not have been copied verbatim into the official log book, or what was in the scrap, scrap log may not have been copied at all uh, into the official log book. Um, in particular, you know, the, the events of the middle watch, when there, all these rockets were seen, there was not a single mention of that ever written down in the log book. And, during the testimony of Chief Officer Stewart, uh, he said there was nothing in the scrap log. And of course he couldn't produce the scrap log, scrap log because it was, the pages were thrown overboard. So he had, so, so it's, it's either you take his word for it or you don't believe him. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know, personally, I don't know what to say I, other than I do view what was, actually written in the California's log book is a little suspect 
because there there is, as I pointed out, I think in the first chapter of my book, some differences between, for example, what was transmitted over wireless at six, you know, for uh, around six thirty p.m. to from California to another steamship, Italian. And what was put in the logbook as to what was seen at the same time were two different things. The wireless transmission, which is probably very accurate at the time, and there's no reason for law, you know, for law to have lied at all, or, you know, at 6.30 on the Sunday the 14th, was that they sighted three large icebergs five miles south of where they were, and they put in a position of where they were as being, if I recall, 42 degrees, three minutes north latitude. In the logbook, it was changed to 42 degrees, five minutes north latitude, and it didn't have three icebergs, it said only two icebergs. So does there, so what was written in the logbook did not quite match what was sent over wireless from one ship to another. And by the way, that message was also, if I'm not mistaken, picked up by Titanic, uh, by Titanic's operator Bride at the time. Um, and I would tend to trust the wireless transmission over what was written in the logbook, which had the, it seems that the logbook was written up in such a way, as I pointed out in chapter, the first chapter of the book, to keep Californian at the same line of latitude, you know, there's the same distance north of the equator, all afternoon, Sunday, and evening as she was when they took the noontime site at 12, at 12 noon. In other words, they did not allow California to actually go south of that point, even though, even though the actual heading of the ship, forget about any currents or anything else affecting the ship, um, actually made California, would have brought California down a little further south from where she was at noon. And the latitude uh, of where she was during the wireless message sent to the Antillian at 630 matches what her course was for the time. Um, so the only thing that happened here is that Californian uh, in the logbook, they basically said, no, we are gonna keep the latitude the same. And the excuse they gave for doing that was that around 7.30, Chief Officer Stewart allegedly took a sextant sighting of the Pulse Star Polaris, which, is, which would give you your exact latitude once you adjust for the usual uh, things you have to adjust when taking sights. Um, and it's according to the testimony of Stewart, the latitude had not changed from noontime when they um, put down uh, that Californian was five miles north of the 42nd uh, la uh, line of latitude. The problem, the problem what you have here is that you have the word of one person who and even Lord was, was, was saying this, that said, we put in the log book something different because we had have, we have better data that was taken an hour after we sent that trend, wireless message to the Antillian, which showed that we were not heading southward as we thought, we were still maintaining the same latitude line as we had at noontime. Then I asked why in the morning when you had made contact with the um, Virginian and you asked the Virginian for a, an official message as to what happened with Titanic during the night, <clears throat> according to the captain of the Virginian, you told him you're, o you're only 17 miles from the distress position put out from Titanic. If you were where your logbook says you were, you would have been about almost 20 miles, uh, almost 19 and a half, 20 miles away. Why did you say 17? 
And then several weeks later, when Stanley Lord wrote a letter to the Board of Trade, he even admitted that he was 17 miles from the Titanic position, at least he thought he was, uh, at the time he found out the official word from the Virginian as to the fact that Titanic uh, was sending out distress messages and was sinking, reported sinking. So, you know, so, so it, it really raises what I would call a bunch of red flags, uh, at least with me. Um, could we prove it? No. But, it, you know, when you get the inconsistencies like that, you, you do have to sometimes wonder. Thank Hopefully you, sir. I the question. Yes. Uh, my next question is Can you please clarify or explain the whole position mistakes with the coordinates that were made on Titanic by uh, Captain Smith? And I do believe it was Boxhall. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, could I explain how they messed it up, how they get it wrong? Uh, yeah, I'm basically just looking for clarity on how and when exactly it happened, especially between the two of them. I think, you know, you're, you're talking about mistakes here. Um, not, I don't think anything was done deliberately. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't done deliberately. And um, even Captain Lord, I believe, honestly believed he was more or less where he thought he was during the night. Um, but what happened with the Titanic uh, situation is that Titanic was sinking. Um, Captain Smith was told, and you probably know that he and uh, Thomas Andrews met up somewhere uh, down below during an inspection of the mail room, and they saw the flooding in the mail room together. This was probably a little about a little after midnight, I think. If I'm not mistaken, Annie Robinson cited um, had said she saw Captain Smith and Andrews coming back from the mail room about um, half hour after the collision happened, which would make it about 12, 10 minutes after 12. And at that time, they knew that Titanic was taken on water in the first three compartments. And there's other, and um, Andrews was continuing with his inspection while Smith went back up to the bridge. And a few minutes later, uh, there's, re there's there was reports from several passengers that saw that said they saw Andrews running up to the bridge, you know, like jumping three steps at a time, getting up there with a look of terror on his face. He probably realized that not only were the first three compartments taken on water, but there was so much flooding in the first, uh, boiler room number six that the ship was beyond uh, salvageable. And he had bad news to tell Captain Smith so we're talking about the t just about the time when the passengers were being roused to come up on deck with life belts. And Smith realized that his ship is not going to stay afloat. And it was probably around then that Andrews told him that he thought he, the ship had about an hour and a half um, remaining. And so obviously, you know, you, you get, what are you going to do besides swing out lifeboats, which you already were in the process of uncovering? Um, but he wanted to get a distress message out. Now he had warned the wireless operators earlier, but I think before he even went on his personal inspection tour below, he, Smith warned the wireless operators, Bryden and Phillips, that they may have to send out a distress message, but not to do so yet until after the, um, you know, the, a, an inspection is completed. Um, that was the report written in the New York Times based on what Bride told them happened. But obviously when um, Andrews comes back and tells uh, Smith, hey, we only have about an hour and a half. Smith obviously had to probably ran into the wireless uh, room and said, here's the position, send it. Now, when did he work up the position? S Smith probably worked up the position sometime before he even went on in his, his, his inspection. We don't know exactly all of what happened on the bridge during the time, other than Boxall coming back from one, his first inspection and telling him there's nothing to report, then going down for a second inspection, coming back up afterwards around 12 midnight to tell him that the mailroom is flooding and it's 
taking on water badly. But Smith, you know, knew that the ship was was seriously injured, but he didn't know how seriously injured until Andrews confirmed that there's no way the ship could be saved. In which case, you don't, you know, it's it's now or never. So let's get a position out. Um, the problem is when you are under a lot of stress and you try to work up something and work with. Now I do this myself. I always make lots of errors, especially if I'm not careful. Uh, the first time around, and if, it, if there's any kind of pressure to get it done within a certain period of time. My guess is, on, in the case of Captain, Captain Smith, when he was doing something like, what's the time difference between the last uh, direct uh, DR position that was taken at, that was given to him at eight o'clock of the ship and when the ship struck the iceberg, I had a feeling he made a mistake by when he did the subtraction of being one hour off. It's a very simple, very simple mistake. And one hour steaming at 22 knots is about a 20 mile error. And so, and again, I have no way of proving it. I, I, was, I, only, I only talk about this as possible ways in which that error occurred. But it seems to me that he accidentally was off by about an hour when he came up with when Smith came up with the original position that was sent out in the initial uh, distress message from Titanic, the one that was sent out at 1025 uh, New York time um, uh, with, the, uh, with the original CQD message. That position was 20 miles west of where we now know Titanic uh, actually sank. We also know that Boxwell, from what he said, when he was busy after he called out the um, other officers around midnight, yay, hey, guess what? We're picking on water. You have to uncover the boats and all that. He was busy uncovering and enlacing boats himself. Um, this is when a light of a, another vessel was sighted somewhere off the port bow of Titanic. And he and Boxtel said that he went on the bridge to take a closer look. Well, this would, would have been just about the time when uh, he would have met Smith and Smith would, could have, and according to Boxwell, Smith had asked him how things are going with the uncovering of the boats. And Boxwell said, the men are working fine, things are going on. And is it, is it serious? And Smith told Boxwell at the time that he, that. Andrews told him that the ship had an hour and a half to live. And although Boxwell didn't quite put it this way in, in any of in the testimony, but it sounds like um, he may have asked Smith at the time whether a distress message had been sent out by wireless. Smith, according to the what Boxwell wrote, la wrote later on in life, um, said that, yes, it was sent out earlier. And Boxwell said, well, what was it based from? And Smith says it was based off of the eight o'clock position. And Boxwell reminded him that they took sites at 7.30 and he knew what the 7.30 star sites were. Would he like to go back? Would he like him to go back and redo the position? And according to what Boxwell said, again, this is around 1962, Smith says, yes, go ahead and do it. And Boxwell went back and recalculated the distress position and then showed it to Smith and then he went, he, would, he took it to the wireless room to give to Phillips. And that was the posi position that was sent out 10 minutes after the, the original position. It was sent out at 10.35 New York time, which gave the famous Boxall coordinates that everybody could just about recite today, at least Titanic uh, enthusiasts, uh, 4146 North, 5014 West. That position, as we now know, was also wrong, but only it was out by 13 miles. And I cover this I pretty much in, I think it was the second chapter of the book where I talk about possibilities of how did Boxall get it wrong? Because we know Smith got it wrong first by 20 miles, Boxall got it wrong by 13 miles. And these are two very competent people. 
And again, it comes down to working under stress. You, you're told that the ship has an hour and a half to live and, and um, there's all sorts of things going you know, through your mind and you're trying to do it, you're trying to do it right. Boxall did admit that nobody checked his results. He just showed him to Smith and said, Smith says, go take him to the wireless room and have them send him out. And apparently um, he was off by 13 miles. First of all, he assumed that the ship struck at 1040, at 1146, which was six minutes later than we have from other sources that say it struck at 1140, which six minutes at 22 knots is two miles. And it's plus the fact that it seems that there was another error made in distance, in uh, time, I should say, about, tw about a 29 minute mistake, which, which when added up to the two miles in distance resulted in a total of about 13 miles uh, or something like um, 17 minutes of arc of longitude. But anyway, it's just, unfortunate errors under stress that caused mistakes to be made. And that one was another big one, which prevented people knowing where Titanic sank for 85 years until Robert Ballard found it. Well, thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, now I'm gonna turn you over to Yvette. She has a few questions for you. All right, hi. <laughs> um, this next question is from um, Bobby uh, from Calgary, uh, Calgary, Canada. And her question is, um, uh, what inspired you to write your Titanic books? Uh, what, what inspired me to write my books? Well, the, well it, it, different inspirations from different, at different times. Um, first of all, um, the first book, the, what I call the centennial book, the one that we wrote in 2011 was, came about because we learned a lot of information in the hundred years since Titanic founded, I mean, the discovery of the, of the wet, of the wreck site itself was obviously very uh, big and, and uh, very powerful uh, uh, difference in terms of what people knew about Titanic. Plus, the fact we knew that the ship didn't quite sink in one piece, but it actually split apart. But there's other things too that uh, after years of research that people have uncovered. And um, I figured, you know, maybe it's time to come up and redo what resulted uh, in 1912 as hastily reports were written after they after only weeks of testimony were taken. So what would happen if we try to you know use like say the British report as a template and say if we were going to re redo this and re-report <laughs> now what we know now from what they knew then how and where and what changes would have taken place. And so I thought that was an interesting thing, but then I knew the areas that I, I'm, I'm good at um, in terms of analysis. So I knew about the ship. I, you know, I knew about navigation. I knew about a lot of technical areas, but there's a lot of other people who know a lot more than I do about certain other areas, including the passengers and the crew and, uh, things like that. And I had a lot of friends in the Titanic community that knew a lot, a lot more than I did. And I said, you know, guys, gals, how about we collectively join together and each of us in our own areas of expertise could write, rewrite uh, the report, the British report, basically using that as a template. Um, <clears throat> and so, that became the birth of the project that resulted in the uh, book that we call Report into the Loss of the 
SS Titanic Centennial. I, I don't want to talk about what happened to the to the to the subtitles uh, uh, Centennial reappraisal. Somehow the history press people decided to leave it off when they went to paperback version, but they never told me about that until after they did it. So, but anyway, the official name of the book is um, reported to the loss of the SS Titanic, a centennial reappraisal. We did this, uh, you know, I have about uh, 10 other co-authors. Uh, that's the one that Jill is holding up, was holding up, there you go. There you go, there you go. Yeah, um, I'm, re I'm really proud of that one. Um, not so much because I contributed a lot, to which, which I did, but I'm very proud of it because I had so much help from so many other talented people that knew a lot in different areas. You know, uh, Bill Worms, uh, Bill Wormstead is on. I think is on this uh, call now. <clears> to <throat> try to get it. I I only see three screens in front of me. And I'm on a tablet, so a little disadvantage here. <clears throat> but he and Ted Fitch and uh, George Behe, um uh, Dave Gittins, uh, Lester Mitchum, uh, all these people had different areas of expertise. Hi, Bill. Oh, my God. Uh, is that a real background? No, that's a fake one. It's a fake background. <laughs> I wish it was a real background, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mine is real, by the way. This, this, is, my, <laughs> this is my office. Uh, picture of the York skyline in the background. Anyway, I know. <laughs> yeah, it was the actual Twin Towers actually taken uh, years before the um, the uh, September 11th event. Anyway, back to what I was saying about the Centennial book. Um, we had great contributions from a lot of talented people in different areas of expertise, which is why I really am probably most proud of that book than any, than any other achievement. Um, and it's not just because it's my work, but it's, it's because the, the collective work of all these talented uh, people. Um, the, the other book, then the other book <clears throat> I got interested in doing. So anyway, that, to answer your question, the, the thing that spurred me on in that was simply, let's redo history. <laughs> because we know a lot more now than they knew um, at the time is back in 1912. Um, the next, the next, my next book, which people don't really know much about, was actually a joint effort between Mark Chernside and myself that dealt not with Titanic, but with Olympic. It was the, uh, the book dealing with the uh, collision between uh, the HMS Hall and Olympic in the Solent in 19, September of 19. 11, I got interested in that only because Mark had access to all the uh, court proceedings that took place during the uh, the trial uh, of uh, the dual trial of Hawk and Olympic that took place in the fall of 1911. Um, and I was sort of interested in, okay, what did they know What and, and what were they working on, and what's the res Is there a way of analyzing the what you know the, the the reasons behind the collision and what happened to that? So Mark and I came up with a book um, that that we that I named the Sting of the Hawk. Although one critic said hawks don't sting, <laughs> but only bees sting. But anyway, it was this, and anyway, Hawk is spelled differently. It's with an E at the end. Hawk. It's, it's named after a, a British um, admiral, I believe. Not not the bird. Anyway, uh, so we did we did that. Uh, Mark and I did that uh, small book uh, uh, together, and that was also self published. Um, the Sting of the Hawk, Collision in the Solent, and and. and um, I was, was very happy about it because for number one, got my mind off of Titanic for several months and onto a different vessel, although it's related. And then this one, um, the last, the one we're supposedly talking about now, 
Strangers on the Horizon, uh, came about because I looked at all the my, my shelves of notes and papers, right? And it said, you know, I did a lot of work over 20 years or something like that. Wrote a lot of articles, um, and, you know, for different um, historical societies and, and so forth. And why not put it all in one place and put it as a book? Otherwise, eventually, this work may get lost. I mean, websites, even though I have a lot of stuff on my website, and anybody could access it. Um, the, the honest truth about websites is they go away after a few years, sometimes. Um, sometimes you only could get access to them is through Wayback Machines and things like that. And you don't always, you don't always have the most uh, up-to-date results. Well, anyway, I decided I did especially a lot of work on the Californian affair. <clears throat> and I talked to my good friend, George Behe, and I said, what do you think? Should I write it, something up about it? And he said, <laughs> in immediate encouragement, he said, yes, yes please do. So I worked on it, came up with an outline. And of course, when it came up with the outline, they said, let's not limit it to just Californian and Titanic. There's a lot of other work I've done sort of related, you know, like on the, the, uh, the Burma, the Mount Temple, um, uh, and uh, the uh, Almerian, um, all related to the old, the entire Titanic affair. And so I decided, let's, let's just come up with a book, which is sort of based a lot on, mostly on the, the Californian incident, but have a chance to put a lot of other stuff into the book that people may uh, use and or find useful uh, going forward. Which is why if you look at the, the back of the book, the, the appendices that I have, I have, uh, I even count, I have, I'm just trying to look at my own book right here, besides, 17 chapters of the book itself and pre, uh, preface and prologue and epilogue. I have appendices A through V, through v which is a lot, a lot of different. And each one is, it has its own thing. And it's a lot of the, a lot of the information, of course, is um, some of it's tangential to the overall story, but nonetheless, very important. Uh, particularly if you really want to dig in and look at all these details. So um, the book, even you, you can see it's over an inch, what, about an inch and a half in thickness, right? I got my, this, by the way, is the draft version. <laughs> it took me several weeks before I actually got my own version. And my, of course, my draft version, I wind up marking up little errors that I find, particularly things, not, nothing, nothing serious. Like um, Cape Race being uh, only 300 miles away <laughs> uh, from Titanic at, at the time. Anyway, um, it was a chance for me to uh, put a lot of the work, the research that I did, document it, get it into one place, to, and, and tie it all together. And that's the result of Strangers on the Horizon. Wow. Thank you. I love seeing your notes. It's two o'clock now and we still have a few questions. I didn't know if you wanted to go a little longer or maybe I could send you the rest of the questions and send them on to the members. Well, I'll see what I'll you. give you maybe 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. Sure. I don't have, nobody's knocking on my door yet, so. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay. Um, Uh, Melissa said, after the sinking, did the Californian captain get shunned the way Ismay did, do you believe? After the sinking, did the Californian captain get what? Captain Stanley Lord, do you think he was shunned the way Ismay was? I'm, I don't know what to say about, you know, Captain Lord. I mean, I, to be honest with you, um, I think the problem was that uh, when people, there's a lot of people that um, will say that they used him as a scapegoat for the loss of life that happened, you know, with the Titanic. And to some extent, that may be true. Um, he's not a scapegoat. I mean, they used him as a scapegoat, and I and I agree with that. But the <clears throat> the one that really needs to 
pick that one up is Captain Smith because he's the one that sailed the ship into a region of ice. He knew, Captain Smith knew there was ice ahead. Unfortunately, he did not double the lookout. He didn't add any additional people on. He, they did not let the, they didn't tell the engine room to stand by ahead, ahead of time in case they had to take evasive actions. <clears throat> There's a lot of things. And, and also he, he knew enough that he could have taken the ship well south uh, of the turning point than he did. He could do like Captain Moore of Mount Temple did and take his ship well south um, of the uh, turning point before heading back. And it wouldn't have added that much more to the overall passage time. Um, but he didn't. And so the primary responsibility is with Captain Smith and nobody can really uh, undo that. Lord, the problem with, that I think Lord that happened with Lord was that he made some bad decisions that night. The first one being very simply, he didn't come up on deck when he was told of rockets. He was told about rockets three separate times. And he, re he didn't come up on deck until like 4.30 in the morning when she forced the steward who saw nothing of it, you know, will woke him up and say, you know, it's time, you know, you wanted to get up now. It's time to resume to Boston. But did you know about that you're in the middle of the watch, you know, rockets were seen. And as I said before, Lord admitted, yeah, he was told about it. He never, he never got up. He never woke up the wireless operator and things like that. And he even regretted, he even said later in life, he regretted not going up himself to see what was going on. And it was a missed opportunity. And, but the real problem that he created for himself is when he went and stopped in Boston, he tried to cover it up. He tried to cover up the fact that California, from the Californian, they saw rockets during the night and those rockets were essentially ignored. Not only did they see the rockets from Titanic, they saw the rockets fired by Rostron from in, in Carpathia around 3.30. So, it, you know, uh, and because of that, and then when you put two and two together and you look at the timing of different things as they did but the timing in both the American inquiry and the British inquiry, um, they very quickly were able to, I did say, you know, to come to the conclusion that California saw Titanic's distress signals and didn't do didn't do what they thought they should have they should have been done. And with the cover up and the lying that took place afterwards, it's like putting your foot in your own mouth. He just made it worse for himself. And. Um, what more can I say? I mean, I know this leads me into our next question by David, which is what What do you think drives the continuing defense of Lord so long after the defense um, the disaster? Emotion. I think people look at this from a very emotional point of view. Some people just, you know, want to believe that um, Captain Lord would not do anything. We would have tried his best to have done something if he knew what was really going on. Um, and I don't understand. I mean, personally, if you ask me, do I do I have any emotion involved in this? And my answer, to tell you the truth, is I have no emotional connection to anybody that lived in 1912. I don't. And it, you need to you need to maintain that if you're going to do an objective analysis. Because once you start attaching yourself to one person or another, you, you, you cannot look at things objectively anymore. You can't. Um, but I think the problem here is a lot of people do that. They're, they, 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 they're emotionally attached for some reason or another to one person or another. You know, like Lord can't do, even Smith can't do no wrong in the eyes of some people. Um, but he did. And history is history and as long as people have emotional feelings it's going to be a debate 
thank you so much. And then we're going to go to our last, <laughs> last two questions from okay. Martin. Mitchell. I know I'm going to say this wrong. Um, he would like to know if you saw the documentary called Titanic Case Closed, there's a claim about reflection that caused the Californian to not see Titanic. Also, we know Californian was swinging during the night in clockwise direction. However, at some specific time, she was swim swinging counterclockwise. Here's the question. Was it normal to swing in two directions while under the Labrador current? And his second question is, why wasn't Titanic influenced this much as she almost stayed still and didn't swing? Excuse my cough. <coughs> Talking too much. Um, good questions. Um, as far as um, the swinging, the swinging, as I said before, was probably caused by the the uh, the, the um, what was noted as periods of calms and light winds, um, plus the fact that Californian was very close to the edge of the ice field within, listen, uh, I think it was Lord Fitz thought he was about only a quarter mile away. <clears throat> when he actually turned the ship, and so you have different you have differences in water as ice is melting, little differences in water temperatures that sets up little eddies around there. So all sorts of reasons for a ship to swing. It's very seldom that a vessel would be totally stopped and pointed in one direction. Plus, even movement in a current. The, even if there's no wind, the movement of the ship on the water, with the water together, would cause a, an apparent breeze, if you want to call it, due to the movement of one knot or whatever it was uh, of wind against the vessel, which over a long period of time would tend to or have the vessel swing one way or the other, depending on which way it's pointed. Um, the la the uh, as far as effective being affected by the current, I believe all the ships in that area were affected by the the same current when they got close enough to each other. Um, Californian and Titanic were probably somewhere between I, I think I said in my book twelve to fourteen miles apart is, is what I'm estimating. Um, and over in twelve to fourteen miles, I don't think you'd see much a a difference in current. Um, it, it being that, that's flowing in the general direction of southward at the time. In fact, that's what brought all that ice and icebergs down was the southern flow of current. Now, as far as as you passing, it, when you're actually steaming westward, and you're steaming westward as California and Titanic did, and there's a current coming, let's say, out of the flowing southward, <clears throat> that current is going to tend to shift you not from off your actual course over the ground or the surface of the earth will be affected together by that current. If it's one knot, you'd be going one knot, one mile south every hour, in addition to how many miles westward you go. Now, Californian was moving at 11 knots, that, which is about half the speed of Titanic. So if you go through an area of a southward setting current at 11 knots, you're only going, uh, you're going at half the speed of Titanic, which means you'll be in it for twice as long over, over the period of time that you, you cross that point until you stop. <clears throat> so California was in that area of southward setting current twice as long as Titanic was before she stopped. So it turns out that both ships actually were um, influenced by the current, by a current setting them southward, but Californian moved twice as far down southward because she was half as, you know, only half the speed and therefore she was affected by the current twice as long to cover the same distance as Titanic. I think in the Centennial book, there is actually a diagram, I talk about that, showing what um, 
the uh, track over ground probably would be a, above the Californian Titanic as influenced by a south setting current. And we know Californian was in very cold water from 4 p.m. onward, from 4 p.m. until she stopped at 10, about 10, 20 p.m. So you're talking about six hours of being in water temperatures that are only a couple of degrees above freezing. That was the, the temperatures of the Arctic, as Captain Lord referred to that, referred to it as the Arctic current, now known as the Labrador, which is setting the ship southward. Did Captain Lord realize that he was being set southward by the current? I don't know. I, I don't know what was in his mind. I don't know what he thought. But he recorded the water temperature. And that those temperature numbers were sent to the uh, US Senate committee and presented in evidence. And I show that in the book. I think that's about it. Yeah, that is. Oh my goodness. I just wanted to say, Thank you so much for your time and answering our questions. And um, I have something to show you that you we're going to send you. It was done by one of our youngest admin members. Her name is Sonia, and she lives in, in um, India. She wasn't able to be here today because of the time zone, and she's also a very good student. Um, but I'm going to screen share here so you can see what so everybody can see what she did. Um, Let's see. It's a really nice gift. All right, where is my screen share? Oh, here we go. Can you see that? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> she hopes you like it. And um, I think That's I wasn't good supposed good. to say she did this. Uh oh, I'm going to get a little scolding. <laughs> I think that I was supposed to say this is. Sorry, Sonia, but she really is just so talented and a wonderful member of oh, our yeah. team. And I will, nice. be, I will be sending that to you. And I really appreciate you being here with us today and, and, and getting through all of our questions. We really appreciate it and appreciate yeah, and you if, being and If anybody needs to follow up, um, you have my email address. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, feel free to send. Okay. Yes, and if any, uh, we also have that email. Just yeah, I have it. And if um, people are subscribed to our newsletter, if you don't subscribe to our newsletter, you can send me a private message with it. I can add that, and um, it's, his email's in there too. Um, and or they can get it for me or you. I mean, this was wonderful. You know, you guys can go online and pick these wonderful books up. I'll show them again. <laughs> you know. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you so much. And anybody that wants to stay, well, we can stay and visit and chit chat. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, Sam. And okay. Thanks so I think much. I, have a, I think I have a dog that desperately wants to go out. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's time. <laughs> Thank if you. I don't leave now, I'll hear a tail wagon on the against my door. <laughs> okay, have a great day. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Bye -bye, Anybody that wants to stay, you can.